Hello, everybody. I'm happy to see that already um, we are quite uh, a lot um, participating at this uh, virtual working session. Unfortunately, we cannot see each other and I won't share um, my video <laughs> because I'm working from home and internet connection is not that bad, um, that good, but I hope you can hear me well. If you have problems, please interrupt me. Uh, if you have problems to understand me, please interrupt me and um, tell me um, this. Yeah, um, I hope you all are healthy and stay healthy. Uh, please take um, care um, in these uh, really strange uh, times. Uh, we will do our best to keep um, the session um, Time, um, time limitation of 90 minutes. I, um, I, uh, I think it's very, it's good if um, you are not speaking and just listening that you uh, mute your micro so that we can really understand who uh, talks um, and don't have uh, any background in, um, noise. Yes, I will uh, now introduce uh, you to iAdopt, iAdopt Working Group. Um, it is, I have to check how this works. Yeah, um, sorry. How does it work? Um, how can I, ah, yes, I know. So, uh, in iAdopt is a working group that already started to be active to years ago, so uh, in January 2018, um, uh, we were just a small um, group of people interested to work on the same issue, um, to find, uh, to harmonize um, terminology on observer properties. Um, uh, and I asked Michael Dippenbrock uh, from Pangaea to join me and then also others uh, from the ENVRI Environmental Research Infrastructure Project uh, to, to discuss with me about um, this um, topic. Uh, and our very first, um, also we, we started to become a task group under the VSIC, uh, the Vocabulary Service and, and Semantic Interest Group um, in March uh, 2018 in um, Berlin at the 11th plenary. Um, we called ourselves conceptualization of measurement parameters. Um, then we had our BOF uh, last, exactly one year ago um, in Philadelphia, uh, changing again our name, harmonizing fair description of observational data. And then uh, we wrote our case statement, which uh, had been accepted. Um, and uh, we started with the kickoff meeting in Helsinki with now the name Interoperable Description of Obs Observer Property, the acronym I adopt. We are now four chairs. Um, uh, that's uh, me, Barbara Magania. I'm from um, the Environment Agency Austria. Then Gwen Moncoffé um, from BODC, Michael Diebenbrück uh, from Pangaea, um, and Maria uh, Stoika. Uh, who was co-designing um, uh, uh, the um, science um, scientific um, science SVO uh, variable ontology. Um, so I just want to introduce that we have six different tasks. The first task um, is about collecting user stories and formalized into use cases, uh, this, which has already been um, done, uh, it is finished. Then task two is survey observation centric terminology. So we, we have sent out a survey um, until end of February. Then we stop the survey, but we'll continue with it uh, after this uh, meeting. Uh, and now we are working on task three, deriving use case requirements and uh, have them to uh, work on the um, semantic representations, um, to, to analyze semantic representation of observer properties against the requirements. And this will uh, take, uh, I think, uh, half a year till October 20. Uh, and then we want to develop an interoperability framework for representing observer properties in environmental research um, by end of this year. 
And in the last months, we will uh, test local mapping design patterns. If you want to um, know more about it, you just read our case statement. You find the link in this slide. Um, so we are interested uh, to uh, address the eye of uh, fair data management by building a conceptual framework to support interoperability between existing terminologies and models. Um, and um, uh, we, we want also to address this by promoting the use of fair terminologies to annotate research data with um, fair vocabularies. So uh, what we are uh, will here today is um, are the following presentations uh, from uh, Sideswara Guru, uh, why fair observer property uh, vocabularies, why this is needed, from Anu uh, de Barayo um, about task one, and Gwen Mankofi about task two, annotation practices and the, uh, and the survey. And, um, and then we will have um, uh, another presentation about the requirements um, by me and in between we will have short discussions on the different presentations. You could uh, click on the, the minutes link and uh, help us to um, with the, um, uh, note taking but we have somebody so um, Alison Pammond helps us to take the minutes anyway. Thank you very much. Um, I will now um, uh, stop sharing the screen, I think, yeah, and um, give, give over to Sideswara Gu. Do you see still my screen? Probably. Um, no, I think um, you don't see my screen and uh, Sideswara can continue, is it? We see your oh, screen, Barbara. Yeah. You see, uh -huh, okay. Um, is it? So down there is a stop. There should be a stop sharing. Stop, stop. At the, at the top of your screen, Barbara. Yeah. Like, like this? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so please, can you continue? Yeah. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, that's good, Guru. Yes. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Barbara. Uh, I'm Siddhesh Guru. I uh, lead a, uh, a data services analytics platform um, in terrestrial ecosystem research network in Australia. So terrestrial ecosystem research network is a uh, is an increased platform. So basically we collect and collect and publish the terrestrial ecosystem data across Australia. Uh, so we are the research infrastructure as part of the one of the uh, 23 funded by the uh, federal government uh, and Department of uh, Education and Skill Development in, in Australia. <coughs> So, so today uh, I will talk about the, you know why why fair uh, the observer properties is required, and then we provide a bit of a use case first with the the ecology domain, and then just to provide the point, uh, especially fair uh, observer vocabularies. So, uh, the ecology is a a uh, bit of a, a complex science, partly because uh, especially uh, the data collection is, you know, predominantly the uh, human observation, and then the variety, the diversity of the data they collect is huge, and then there is no uniform methodology that is used as a protocol kind of a thing. Is a partly because of the, you know, most of the thing depends on the which biome or the eco region they are collecting the data as well. So generally, it takes a couple of days if they go to a plot to collect the, you know, a lot of the data. They, they site level, the soil information, the, the geology information, the landform, and then the, the vegetation 
and then flora fauna, uh, the structural aspect of it, uh, etc. Uh, because of all this complexity, you know, how, my, how they collect the data is, a, is quite fairly different from each of the uh, survey methodologies that is used. Uh, so, for example, you know, in turn, turn has got a uh, the OSPLOT uh, survey protocol. So, you know, they collect the uh, fairly the vegetation structure. Uh, so, it's it's it was built to collect the rangelands uh, uh, and collect the fair bit of the vegetation structure, uh, and then the soil, and then the landform, etc. And then generally, when we get the data, it's it's like this. You know, it's a complete big database. Uh, we get the thing, and then we also get you know basically collect a lot of the state government agencies' data. Uh, so basically, we pull those information. So very similar the plot based ecology data. For example, in the Queensland, the it is called the Core Wedge, the database. You know, it's basically the vegetation. Uh, survey across Queensland. You know, currently there are about eighteen thousand plots across uh, Queensland. So it's a very typical thing. You know, we get the data like this with the with the database with the with the fair bit of a terminology. And in the New South Wales, um, it's called the Bionet. Uh, so this is the database we get. Uh, so this is a bit complex, partly because they merge the both the flora and fauna together. Uh, so that's why you know it's, it's a bit of a complex thing. <clears throat> uh, however, you know whatever they collect, you know the uh, the pattern is the is the same, but how they collect varies. You know if you look at the thing. So so the pattern generally with the plot base is you know uh, it's a, they go and do the survey of a site. You know, especially state government agencies, most often is a one-off thing because they have to collect, collect, you know, collect the entire state. It's a one-off, and then sometimes they do the revisit. And if it's a small plot, you know, if it's a research-centric, you know, I especially typically ILTR, you know, it's a, there is a fair bit of a repeated uh, measurement. <clears throat> and then the observation there is a, you know, each of the each of this. Uh, you know the databases have got a in a fairly a standard survey methodology but sometimes they change in the middle you know they don't document it that is a bit of a challenge um, and then the there is a very you know meaning of the terms is very centric to the methodology you know we can't it's very difficult to have a you know very generic meaning for which which may cover everything but what we may provide a wrong impression to the user if we just you know shove everything to one uh, terminology kind of thing. So uh, even though uh, the term may be the same, but the meaning of the term is a uh, different. So that's why you know in the vocabulary side of the thing, you know if you look at the interoperability, you know Barbara said that the, they are looking at the eye. You know, you can fix the syntaxis aspect of it, structural interoperability aspect of it. The semantic is the most important thing, you know, in, especially in the ecology, uh, where how do we make sure that the semantic interoperability should happen, that kind of a thing. And, uh, <clears throat> and additional to that, there is a lot of the terminologies which is very database centric. You know, there may be a fair bit of a, the, you know, that has got, uh, you know, very biased towards the state where they take the data, and then how the uh, how the pro protocol is evolved over the years, kind of a thing. So if you take this as a pattern, so basically, typically, uh, you know, as a as an uh, as an aggregator like us, you know, we so currently we have around you know ninety six thousand plots data across you know all the states of Australia, and then the you know some of the uh, research plots as well. You know, how do we harmonize all this information together? Uh, for example, you know, if, if there is any uh, a database and then there is a feature of interest and there is an observed property in that feature of interest, each one have their own definition. Uh, if you take, for example, the, uh, the vegetation height as an example, uh, the vegetation structure as a feature of interest of that one, um, the height, you know, how they define, how they measure, you know, it, it may be generic as the measurement is the same, but depending on the slope and everything, they have a variances of the definition of the height as well. 
uh, and then the classic example is the median height how they calculate the median is different from the each of these uh, protocols uh, so uh, for example if we take if we if we take the median height and then if we create a general global vocabulary as a median height we can't just technically shove everything to a general vocabulary and just ignore the uh, the database centric definition of the uh, median height okay so however from our perspective you know the global view of that is important partly because then we should provide a, a search capability for a for that term across the different databases but what we want is that the user should get the definition of a, any data the uh, definition of the data they access so for example in this picture if they look at the first data if they access the median height from the first database they should get a definition of the first database when they pull the information okay so that the the semantics of the definition uh, you know basically doesn't you know more bolt into something else it is propagated uh, to the user however the global observe, uh, global uh, view or the global observe property is also important partly because that helps us to basically group all this together and then provide like a one view to the user uh, when you when you do the search and uh, access uh, kind of a thing so if we take this as an example so basically why fair is important in this way so again if we take the um, you know uh, the, in the in the vocabulary space you know we can do all these things if we one identifier for the each of the vocabulary and then we need to make sure that you know that is accessible you know so that's why you know, predominantly you know in this space we use rdf as a as a format so that it's very easy to access and then the standardized way to, to communicate kind of a thing and then the interoperability is the main thing we are trying to resolve as part of this uh, uh, you know uh, part of the vocabulary uh, uh, you know uh, uh, to building this vocabulary and then as part of that the formalizing the definition at the source level you know what the that protocol says is very important and then the propagation of that is the very important for us you know we can't have the one global vocabulary and try to merge together and then just let go the the protocol centric definition of that term basically you know if somebody integrate the data then it's very hard for them to understand they know that there is a nuances it's very hard for them to understand you know what is what exactly is the definition of this one when they look at the thing so so what we believe that is you know when we are propagating the data we need to propagate the uuid of that of the definition of that individual term so that the user get to read the exact definition of what that term is in that database protocol kind of thing so uh, and then if we use the for example if the most of the data is a linked data then it's very easy to make this as a reusable uh, you know expose that as a linked data and then people can download in whatever format they want and then make it as a reusable component so this is at the uh, for example at the, uh, um, at the at the plot level and then this can go to a different scale as well for example it, this is an example of a structural formation form uh, the left hand table is the is the protocol standard protocol and the right hand is the similar data collected you know derived from the remote sensing so as a user you know you should know the difference between the human observation data as well as the remote sensing data even though they are the very similar kind of a thing uh, data they are talking about uh, that's where the vocabulary is very important just to as an upfront you know people at the user should know okay what data comes as a remote sensing and what is the human observation even though they are the very similar thing so in summary so what we are trying to do what is important is you know in ecology you know due to the survey methodology you know what is used as a definition the tight integration is very hard um, 
you know, we can't just, you know, put everything together and then make one generic global view of the data and then give it to the user. So basically what we are doing is we are dumbing down the data and then most of the ecologists won't use this. For example, if, they, if they're modelers, they won't use that kind of a data, partly because they know that there is a lot of nuances, there is a lot of differences there, and without knowing that they wouldn't use it. So that's why the semantics is the key, the semantic interoperability is the key. So uh, so the the main intention for this is the propagation of that, uh, the semantics of the each of the uh, terms and definition with the data uh, that will basically resolve a fair bit of this issue. Um, so, uh, so we have built a, uh, uh, enough, um, fair bit of, a, um, the vocabulary for a lot of the terms we are working on currently. So it's available on that website, you know, I'm happy for people to go and have a look there. Uh, quickly acknowledgement to our team and then Simon Cox, uh, working with us on this one, at, at least in the initial part of the project. I think I'm on time. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, thank you very much. You are in time. Um, it was very interesting. Um, any question, uh, immediate question to uh, Guru, if you have now um, something to say. We have one or two minutes left. <laughs> so, my, I have a question. Um, do you think that you will um, really look at what iAdopt is going to do in the next months and see how this, yeah, contribute to, to our um, interoperability framework and see if you could adopt it or, or yeah, so that would be a you know, very interesting thing, uh, uh, especially the uh, the framework, especially the the definition of the thing, especially at the global level. Uh, so we want to align with the uh, you know with the community standard. Uh, so we are currently looking at the and with this as well, um, but the whatever the I adopt you know comes out with the framework, we will be very keen to use it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I think Anu is now um, uh, should now present. Uh, Anu, do you want to share yourself the screen, or should I do it for you? Yeah, I think I can share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, give me a second. Screen one. Share. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Anu Surya. I'm a data scientist um, and part of Pangea group. Pangea is a data infrastructure for earth and environmental science data set uh, in Germany. Um, I would like to repeat uh, what Barbara mentioned at the beginning of this session. Uh, one of the main expected outcome of, uh, of this working group is um, to develop an interoperability framework for representing observable properties. And to develop such framework, we need to first identify the requirements. Um, so we, the working group, um, follow a use case driven approach um, to develop such requirements. Um, first, we start with collecting user stories. So what are user stories? User stories are um, informal and short description of users' expectations, um, and such such a story consists of several parts. For example, uh, the type of the user and um, what they want to uh, what they want and why they want such uh, such a feature from the framework so on the right hand side you can see an example of user story submitted to the working group uh, where a data manager want to do translation between two terminologies related to observable properties, one from BODC and the other one is from the climate and forecast model, standard names, um, so that, um, that the, manage, the data manager can actually create data files uh, that consists of um, terms from the both terminologies 
So in addition to these three um, format, we also um, require the domain, applicable domain, as well as any additional information that um, relate, related to the user stories. Um, so far, um, we have received um, 17 user stories and these user stories were collected through GitHub issues. And these user stories are not final. Um, so our plan is to work together with the user who contribute user story to further develop the requirement together with the contributors. I mean, the contributors of the user stories. And of course, if you would like to submit um, uh, user stories to this uh, group, uh, you can do it so through the GitHub link here. So um, now I'm going to talk about the process of uh, deriving use cases from the user stories we receive. So the first step what we did is for each of the user stories, we uh, label important keyword that summarize um, the main aspect of the stories. For example, here you can see user story 17, which, which is from the previous slide, and we identify what are the main keyword. And the next step is once we identify main keyword, we summarize the, um, the stories in a more simple uh, few sentences. As you can see here, um, in the second column summary. And then in addition to the summary of the user stories, um, we also um, standardize uh, the domains or subject area, as you can see in the table here, and user role. Um, why we standardize? Uh, because the, the input, the stories from the user are quite unstructured. So in order to make further analysis, we need to um, structure, use some standardized terms of domains and user roles. So, so, so far for domains, uh, we have um, identified relevant uh, subject area based on the classification produced by DFG. D DFG is a German research foundation. And we also identify user role so um, there are five user roles, which is data user. Um, basically, this refer to the research scientists and the data collector refer to individuals that collect and create data sets. Repository and scientific data provider refer to, for example, data center is the infrastructure and the terminology provider refers to those who offer terminology as well as terminology engineers. Um, so once we standardize the user role, then we could make analysis, for example, distribution of user role um, of the stories submitted. As you can see, out of 17 um, user story we receive, um, most of the um, most of the stories are um, um, being uh, specified from the perspective of data user, which, which we have about eight stories. Um, all right, so now the step three is how we, I will explain how, uh, through this example, how we derive use cases from user stories and, and then group these use cases. Um, so first what we did is that we identify use case from the user story. As you can see here, use case 1.1, semantic modeling. And this use case is about developing um, formal, it's about de developing terminology representing domain concepts. And this use case are, um, the, this use case was developed based on the user stories uh, 3, 13, 14, and 18. So once we, and then we follow the same step, we look, look at all the user stories and then we derive relevant use cases. And then we classify or group the use cases into four main use case groups. So in these slides, you can see one use case group, which is about terminology generation and management. And this use case group contain 
uh, five use cases, uh, which is about um, creating and curating and managing terminologies. Um, there are a few important remarks here. In addition to the use cases derived from the use, user stories, we have also um, added relevant use cases. For example, in this table, you can see the last row 1.5, which is about multilingual support. This is something we added because we think this is the necessary in, con in consideration with the existing projects, uh, but we don't have a relevant user story submitted in relation to this use case. Um, um, the other, the second important remark is that one user story um, may be applicable to more than one use case. Uh, for example, if you look at the user story 15, the circle here, and uh, this is applicable to two use cases, which is terminology management and one, and the other use case 1.3, which is semantic alignment. So overall, we have four use case groups. And in this uh, table, you can see the definition of each of the groups. And we have, uh, and the third uh, column actually indicate the number of use cases we have developed so far. Um, on the right, you can see um, a chart that represent the coverage of the use case group. So, so far you can see that um, the groups of uh, terminology generation and management and data, um, and data manipulation integration have almost higher, uh, um, uh, this group have mostly uh, addressed by the user story submitted. Um, all right, so I think that is from my side. Uh, but before I end, I just want to go back to this slide again because there's always a confusion. What is the uh, distinction between use cases and user stories? And user stories are very application specific. Use cases are generalization of uh, one or more user stories. Um, if, if I put it simply, the, their distinction. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, Barbara, thank should you. I um, stop sharing the screen or? Yeah, uh, you, can, you can use the next, two slides, the next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you see here the overview of the uh, use cases. So we have uh, the definitions of the de use cases here also. And if you click on the link, you could see it online. Um, yeah, we, we are aware that probably this is not uh, everything. Um, it's not cover co covering all the possible use cases. So. Uh, could be that we come up with new ones um, in the next month, I think. Um, and as we said, we are also happy to get uh, user stories. Uh, still, I think we, we said the, uh, till end of April. Um, so please have a look at it. If you see that there is something missing right now, um, could you just um, come up with some ideas. We have a, a few minutes, 10 minutes or so to discuss about this. If you see something um, that should be added here. Somebody wants to say something? It was a nice job and well presented. Yeah, it's a lot of work, <laughs> harmonization and discussions. <laughs> it, it, it is, and I think it is very, um, for me at least, seeing it for the first time, sorry, Barbara, John Grebeel here, uh, so, but seeing it consolidated for the first time, I think you guys have done a nice job of, of trying to capture the essence of what you're working with. It's very challenging. Yeah, probably, uh, could you go to the next slide, Anu? You see here also the user stories uh, in GitHub and you see, you don't see a lot. I just wanted to show you that we try to label 
to use um, tags uh, for the user stories uh, and uh, assign the different use cases that would apply here. And the, the job that we will have now is to go back to the contributors of the user stories and ask them if they uh, agree with these assignments because this is our is the core group interpretation yeah and so um, I, I know uh, there are uh, a few of the use, uh, user story providers uh, right now in, in this virtual room um, so you could look at the user stories in github um, and, and then also check not you could do it now or also afterwards uh, please have a look um, and come back to us uh, also after this uh, meeting in the next days come back to me or to the group um, you can also discuss this right in github because all these are issues so you could say it's not okay that this user stories has to do with data integration or so so I really invite you to work on this and come back with your opinion. So if you have immediately right now some objections, some ideas, I know it's a lot of information. It's really hard to, to discuss this now. But somebody is asking some, is this work you're going to have as a deliverable recommendations for concept mapping infrastructure that can enable capturing the relationships among codes for observed properties in different systems. Yes, uh, um, we will have a deliverable on the inter interoperability framework, which is trying, um, which is trying uh, to, to really map uh, the different approaches to each other. Um, but this is not now. Um, the case. Um, uh, so we are working on, on this at the end of the year. So we are now collecting requirements from these user stories and use cases. Yeah, anybody else that wants to say something? You can directly speak. Nobody wants to contribute? Simon, somebody else right now? Sorry, what's the, uh, no. this is just a list of issues in the GitHub, is it, Barbara? Yeah, it's a list of the user stories in GitHub, which are uh, organized as, as issues. Um, how do you uh, prefer, how do you want the, doc, the conversation to unfold from here? Um, do you want um, comments on particular issues in GitHub uh, to continue um, for yes. each of these, on particular stories, I should say, uh, that are expressed as issues to continue? And um, likewise, for other parts of the repository, people are welcome to either uh, add a comment to an existing ticket or create a new ticket for a, for a more general document no. or more general question. Is that it, true? Each or? user story has an issue, is an issue, yeah, and mm -hmm. so you can discuss uh, right in the issues because you can have the complete track of discussions uh, mm -hmm. on each of the okay. uh, users. A, a quick question about those uh, user stories and the sort of labels that appear highlighted there. Um, is that highlighting something that um, uh, is being done after the fact? So, or, or are you expecting contributors of user stories to um, do that highlighting uh, themselves? I think they should comment before they do the highlighting uh, themselves. Uh, because this should be uh, yeah, somehow a structured discussion and an agreement on it. Uh, but if, if you go back, Anu, to the first slide of this so, discussion. Let, let me um, rephrase my question. So yeah. if I'm going to contribute a couple of user stories, I just write them in accordance with the template that's there on GitHub as a you know role, I want to blah, 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 so that blah, blah, blah. And then that annotation will happen or that labeling will happen magically afterward. Is that correct? So the, yeah. So 
first, I, there's, if you want to contribute with a user story, there is a, a help uh, on how to do it. So you go to, to this link, which is shown here, uh, so that you have a user story, you can upload it. And afterwards, so to, to be able to do this, you, you need to have a GitHub account. So then um, if you are not part of the core group, I think you have no way, you cannot really um, assign a label, but you can discuss this. So you can uh, contribute to the discussion in the issues. And then uh, the, youth, the core group can assign this label, what you suggest. Perfect. So, so um, what I just heard you say is, hey, if you want to um, contribute a couple of user stories, go ahead, put them in as issues, use the template that's shown there on the right, yep. and that's it. That, that's yep. great. Thank you. Yeah. Anu, can you also go uh, down to the discussion and the first slide of the discussion here? So I think what is still interesting to look at is uh, um, also to discuss about these use cases. If they are uh, uh, broad and uh, or, uh, detailed enough or if we need more use cases and so on. And we have um, also about the use cases an uh, extra um, GitHub repository uh, where you could look at the issues there. So, um, and, and there's another question, so I'm reading it more or less the same question. Are the activities and links documented on the VG web page? Sorry, I cannot see the page. Uh, yes. So, uh, at the end of this uh, slides, you will see all the links to our GitHubs and uh, documentation in, in, in Google uh, Drive. So, you will get everything. So, you can also see all the discussions we had so far and so on. So, um, you will see it at the end. What I want to show you right now, for, uh, so that um, Anno, can you stop presenting? So I can show something. Um, I have to find out. Um, okay, it's a bit difficult. Ooh. GitHub. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen? I hope so. Um, yes, yes, we do. Yeah. Got okay. it. So I have here, let's go to iAdapt. Um, we have in iAdapt four repositories, yeah, a glossary, a documentation, a terminologies and use case analysis but now five and user stories. So the user stories is, uh, are, are those issues with the different users. So each of this issue is a user story, yeah? With these uh, labels and you could click then on it and then discuss it, uh, see this and then comment it and so on, okay? And apart from it, uh, from this one, you can also go to the, to the user Users, uh, use case analysis where we have issues discussing this table that I presented before. So um, about the structuring and so on. And this is something that we have really to fix very soon because um, after uh, having defining these use cases, we have to come to the next step, which are the requirements. Okay. That's all what I wanted to show you. Um, but yeah, probably also uh, one last step because it was asked before. Um, I wanted to show you that we have a Google Drive uh, with all um, information um, uh, about our group. Uh, so the group um, link that I have um, uh, posted at the end of the presentation would bring you to this. And you, here you see references, outreach, meetings, and documentation. So here you see all the meetings we had the last two years, yeah, with all the documentation. So you could always look at it. And we have documentation about our sessions and also the tasks, okay? So that you know that. I will now stop this and I will go give over to, um, to Gwen, please. Uh, can you go ahead? 
um, with your presentation. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and share my screen. Yes, we see it now, Gwen. Can you see it? I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see mine. We can see we can see your screen. All right. Okay. Oh, it's because I'm on the wrong. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go back. Okay. Okay. Good evening. Well, hi everybody. It's different time of the of the day for every one of us. Uh, so I'm going to I'm Gwen Mokwafe from the British Oceanographic Data Center, uh, based in the United Kingdom. Um, so I'm going to present the result of the survey we did uh, to try and um, understand the existing annotation practices that are being used uh, by different um, different organizations, um, either observable property models or terminologies. Um, by either consumers or uh, providers of terminologies. So we, um, we worked on the survey, on developing the survey between uh, the end of October until uh, mid-January. Um, and it was quite an involved process, uh, but it made us understand very, or clarified some of the, some of the um, issues we wanted to look at. And we deployed the survey on the 23rd of January, and it ran for five, five and a half weeks. Uh, I mean, it's still running, it's still open, but we decided to um, anal start analyzing the, the results so that we would be ready for, to prepare for the plenary, plenary session. So as of the 1st of March, we had 33 valid uh, complete responses and we had four incomplete ones. Um, so 20, 21 of those 33 valid response were from organizations or individuals who were both providers and consumers of uh, terminologies. Six of them were only providers and six of, the, of them were only consumers. So all in all, we had 25 terminologies um, those will be used as a basis for our catalog, which we will discuss later uh, after, after my presentation. Uh, so we, we had to clean the list, remove some of the duplicates. Uh, I mean, we still got the information in the survey, but in terms of the catalog, we remove the duplicates and any non-relevant uh, entries. Um, and now we will be starting the harmoni harmonizing the metadata uh, deciding what we want to capture as metadata from either from the survey or from additional contact with the people who provided the information. Um, and um, so in terms of language, most of the uh, terminologies were English, English language based, uh, but we also had some submission for bilingual French English uh, terminologies. Um, and also some comments from um, terminology provider to say that they were actually able to support multilingual translations and some of them had already started doing that. So that's an interesting point. Can I move that? Yes, I can. There is. Okay, so in terms of uh, responders affiliation, um, so as you see on the, on the plot there on the left, uh, the two main columns were actually from research infrastructure. So the people who responded to the survey were from research infrastructure and data center, uh, and data center here uh, predominantly. So people could tick more, it was a multiple session, so, so one person could have actually ticked several of those uh, categories, but it gives us, um, it gives us uh, an overview of, um, of the distribution of people. Uh, so in terms of geographic coverage, uh, I think it's quite interesting to see that, so you've got two columns there, the one uh, labeled all is actually all, the, all 33 completed questionnaires. And the one on the right is looking at only people who say that they were providers or both providers and consumers of uh, terminologies. 
so you can see that uh, well, it might, many many of the countries represented are either English-speaking countries or European countries, and we've got quite a bit of gaps. Uh, we are missing uh, people from South America or Hispanic countries, including Spain, but uh, also the whole Hispanic world. Uh, we are missing quite a lot from um, from Africa as well, India, Asia, uh, Russia, etc. So, so this is something we might want to look at uh, in the future to try and uh, promote our work and try to attract more people from more diverse um, uh, geographic distribution. So, in terms of profile of responders. Um, so again, three big columns there, they were researchers and data managers, not surprisingly, uh, and they were in about equal representation. Uh, and the good thing is that all except one uh, said that they, they, they were agreeing to being contacting and contacted and, and contributing further to the work or mentioned. So this is, this is good. Um, so in terms of domain coverage from the people who, who filled in the survey, so it was principally terrestrial ecology and aquatic ecosystems, oceanography and biodiversity. They were the big dominant, dominant dom uh, area there. Uh, but really there was representation from quite a lot of the categories we had, we had uh, suggested. Uh, one important thing to notice on this plot is that arrow there where you can see that we don't have much representation from remote sensing at all. And I think that is something we should probably address by trying to uh, find people from the remote sensing community interested in our work uh, and work with them or on the observable property interoperability. Um, and then just to give you some details about what was in the other column, um, people could fill in what, you know, what was um, uh, missing. So there were people from computer science and informatics, four of them, uh, and from ecology and forest science and genetics as well. So in terms of domain coverage of the terminologies themselves, all the repositories, so terminologies on the left, repositories on the right. Uh, so we can see that it is very similar profile, uh, not surprisingly considering that many people were actually both consumers and providers of terminology. Um, so there's a strong, again, strong representation from the biology, diverse biodiversity, aquatic ecosystem, and oceanography fields. Um, and many terminologies were actually, so it was multiple choice again, uh, a response, and many terminologies uh, could be described as being multidisciplinary, really, or, or generic. Um, they could actually cope with um, a broad range of domains. So one other point to say on this slide is that the uh, column, uh, not, not the column biology, so it's points to the wrong, but the column uh, other in the consumers uh, plot is actually, there were people there uh, coming from uh, economic domain and also interested in ocean contaminants. So this is an interesting piece of information. Um, for the, the kind of observations that were supported by the existing terminologies. So in the questionnaire, we were offering already a number of, uh, of, um, of choices uh, and the possibility of uh, filling in uh, additional fields if um, through the other field, addition, to providing additional uh, domain or, or information through the other field. Uh, so here you can see, well, physical, chemical, so most of terminology could, um, most of those cross domains were actually well represented in the terminologies. Um, so it was physical, chemical, and also in the others, it was people were saying ecological, biological, which is somehow logical. Uh, and then, but you can see that there's, there was a small number only of people with, um, whose terminology could support taxonomic uh, information or genomic information. Uh, in terms of uh, the types, the type of, of observations that uh, the terminology could support, 
so it, as you can see, most of the most of the um, the choices we were offering um, were well supported by the terminologies. Um, I don't think there's much to say there, but just maybe highlight for for those of you who are not familiar with um, with the discussion we had. But it was a uh, in situ, so we were interested in knowing whether people whether the terminologies were supporting in situ sensor based, in situ human based uh, observations remote sensing observations, simulated like model, modeling output observations, uh, field experiment or laboratory experiment. So as you can see, most terminologies can, can cope with all those uh, different types of ob observations. Uh, and does your terminology contain concepts uh, related to, so this was across a, a bit of a mixed range of, of kind of observations that don't always fit neatly. Um, and we wanted to try and get a, a broad picture of what the terminology could support. So again, as you can see, all the things we, we came up with, most, most terminology could also, some, well, all of them had at least um, 10 terminologies that could, could cope with it. So this was the result for terminologies, but the, the distribution was very similar for repositories. So I'm not going to show that. And also uh, we ask uh, very specifically the questions whether the terminology could support quantitative and qualitative observations. And all but one said that they could support both kind of observations. Sorry, Gwen, just I wanted to say that we don't have that much time left. How much do I have left? You are already over the time, but you three Am minutes I? of so. right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's late. yeah. So uh okay, that's not that again, that's just uh, well distributed through. Um so in terms of uh, primary use case for the existing terminology, well not very surprising here, integration, data harmonization, improving the data, data just they put the key use cases uh, for the, this kind of activity. Uh, um, in terms of external reference for biological and chemical names, um, as you can see here on the, on the, for the biological names, you've got the word uh, worms is well represented, uh, but there's also a lot of others, uh, and some of them is NCBI. Uh, taxonomy, six of them uh, were using it, and then the PC, which is, a, I think, a European uh, registry of species. And then on the chemical side, uh, CAS and KB were used, but there were as well, surprisingly, a lot, quite a, a lot of uh, terminologies that, uh, that said that the, the chemical name was not relevant. Um, and then um, many use locally built um, lists as well, which would be interesting to exchange about that. A unit and conceptual model. Um, so again, here on the unit side, uh, you can see <laughs> that people are using other lists, but there was QUDT and UDONET were the two dominant one, but apart from that, there was a lot of uh, other lists that were used as well, that didn't, were not on our list. Uh, and semantic model, many people are using other models than the one we had come up with, but in terms of dominant models, it was DATS, O&M, OBO. And then someone using no, no model at all. So that's my last slide. So the um, a nitrogen case study, again, we ask uh, what kind of nitrogen uh, variables people would be, um, um, people had in their uh, in their repository or in their um, in their terminologies, and you can see that it's all very well represented. Um, and in the other categories, there was ratio, emission, deposition, uh, and anthropo uh, related to anthropogenic processes and natural processes. Uh, we also had nine, nine spreadsheet submissions, uh, and then a lot of a, a couple of. Uh, extensive list of uh, variables related to nitrogen. Right, sorry to go over time. 
Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so perfect. So, um, you this took a um, so, should I? Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Introduce the discussion. So, so basically, what we would like to focus on the discussion is the what should be our next step for building the catalog of terminologies. So here is a list of all 25 terminologies we've got so far. They are very, very different from each other. Uh, some of them are in, targeted at very specific fields or very specific traits, uh, um, and others are full models. Um, so we, okay, we need to come up with uh, may I say something to the first, to that slide? Yeah. So it is not complete. So for example, ENVO is not there yet. So we expect still uh, <laughs> some... Why is, uh, why is ENVO not there? I don't see ENVO. Can you go yeah, back? So it is, is yeah. it uh, How do you go back? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, ENVO. Ah, and Enftes is here. I uh, know Envo. No, actually, Barbara, Envo is not here because it's not. Yeah. There's no. There's no mission yet. Yeah, but I, I, uh, yeah. I know that we will work on it. I hope. Yeah, I'm, we'll yeah. Be I mean, there. obviously, that's mm -hmm. why I was saying it. It is the base to the catalog, but yes, it, it will need to be. I mean, it's, it's like it's like the, the user stories, isn't it? We want to carry on attracting more more input yeah. from. Um, yeah, I have a comment on the Pangea parameter because I'm managing it. Um, uh, that shouldn't be in the catalog because it's an uh, unstructured. Um, I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you could. I know. I have already it. deleted it in oh, the okay. in the actual catalog. Okay. Yeah, you've got. Yeah, I knew you've got a comment there. So yeah, it's just. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is this was just put together last week, so it's really fresh from the from the yeah. source. So and Pierluigi so it's is... Really, it's really just a start. Yeah, Pierluigi is asking us to publish it on GitHub, but I think first we have to decide also on the metadata elements to we should yes, uh, yeah. highlight. Yeah. So, so in terms of metadata, really, we have to think, you know, why we want to, why, why we want, what kind of metadata we want to associate to those terminologies. And really, it is to help us assess the terminology with regards to their fitness for purpose. Um, for the in relation to the requirements we will identify uh, to address the user the user cases and the user stories. So it's really so if you could help us come up with um, a list, a definite list of of uh, metadata fields. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we, want to, we don't want to create more work than is really necessary. So if you're aware of list of of metadata fields that are already useful, that people yeah, have used. You know, Gwen, about no... Clément Chancré, uh, who works on metadata for terminologies, mm -hmm. so they have 200 fields. That's quite too much, I think. But yeah, um, no, I mean, yeah. But that's what I'm saying. You know, we're not trying to do a catalog for the sake of doing a catalog. We're really doing it so that it can inform our work. Uh, with regards to uh, working with the, with the terminologies that have submitted information and see how they fit the requirements and or how they could fit the requirements for uh, to address the user stories. I mean, would, would anybody disagree with that or? Sorry, it will, will be, I didn't get it. Will we put this also as GitHub issues somewhere? So that we can discuss it. Yeah, we can. I mean, we can. Yes, we will need to. We will need to create a, a discussion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can uh, do it as a as a as a as a, a repository. Report. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, may I add some of the uh, comments I've read uh, here? First of all, there was the question why we focus on environmental sciences. Yeah, this is. Uh, our group is at the moment focusing on this domain because it's already quite diverse and difficult. And if we succeed in this area, then yeah, perfect. Then we can just uh, look at other domains like health and so on. But um, yeah, we need to start small, although I think environmental sciences are already very diverse and difficult uh, to solve. And then we can see if you can agree also on other in other domains um, because 
we have everywhere observable properties, that's, that's sure. So, um, is there a form for submitting vocabularies? Yes, there is a form also for submitting vocabularies. At the end of this presentation, you will see the link to the survey. Um, and um, yeah, if you just want to have uh, to, to list the vocabulary, then that's also fine. But for us, for our whole study, it would be much, much better if you really could contribute to the survey. Um, yeah, there are 45 questions. Are there 45 questions, uh, John? I'm not sure. It takes, uh, yeah, I must say it's a quite long survey. It takes you 20 minutes at least to 30 minutes or 40, depends how uh, accurate you are. <laughs> so it, it will take you some time, but I think we really need these details. Yeah, and you um, can save it. You can save it as well and, and start it again. So, yeah. Any other suite was also mentioned, but uh, suite is not documented as uh, um, uh, um, as uh, uh, terminology, terminology as such. Yeah. It was uh, mentioned from other from other perspectives. Yeah. Any other questions right now on this? Um, we would really like to have. Um, you discussing in GitHub about the metadata? Survey link, uh, the survey link. Can anybody put the survey link uh, in the in the uh, Zoom uh, chat? Uh, you will find it anyway on the on the presentation. I now share the screen. Is it okay, Gwen? Can you stop yeah, sharing? Yeah. I need to do anything. Oh, thank you, thank you, Sirko, for uh, putting in. The link to the survey. We also want to acknowledge all, all your work. Uh, so when we publish um, uh, this work, uh, you will be mentioned there. So please uh, read all the meta information about the survey. Um, okay. I do you see my screen? Yeah. I, I go to the last uh, two uh, slides because it was asked so often. Um, and I present. So uh, I bring it now um, because uh, that you, so, so you can see how we work. We have uh, two telcos per month. Uh, the first Thursday at 6 uh, p.m which is US friendly, that's set time, yeah, so Central European time. And the third Tuesday at 10 set, uh, which is Australia friendly time. Um, and we have some inter, um, some uh, core group discussions also in between. And you can find all the material on Google Drive and ongoing work in the GitHub, and these are the links. And um, yeah, you, if you want to participate and to contribute, please first subscribe to iAdopt so that you get all the information uh, sent out by me for uh, teleconferences and so on. Uh, you can still contribute uh, with your user stories in GitHub, and this is the link uh, uh, to um, provide uh, a new issue with a uh, user story, and you could still participate at the iAdopt survey. And user stories and service are at the open till end of April. Could be that we we are accepting them till end of May, but at a certain point we have to work with the material we have. Otherwise, we we cannot go to the um, to the next step. So um, I go back to the presentation on requirements. So just a few words uh, about me. Uh, I am a landscape ecologist and geographic information sci uh, scientist. In the last 10 or 15 years, I'm working on semantics too. And I'm writing my PhD on this topic. And that's also why I'm so interested in trying to push forward this, um, this um, topic uh, in a working group. Um, and uh, I will introduce to you the first ideas of uh, about requirements. Uh, so what are requirements? These are all um, the, um, um, the needs um, to 
provide uh, to support a given use case. Yeah, uh, what we can um, do this with the, that model. So we have to find out uh, which is the best model, or which are uh, which approaches uh, should we consider, or which parts of the approaches. Um, that are already in use are useful or not for the different use cases uh, and user stories. So the goal is to test the suitability of existing models and ontologies and to come up to a set of requirements. Um, so uh, to, uh, to have at the end a requirement specification for our interoperability framework. The interoperability framework is not uh, again a new model. Yeah because there are so many already outside there. Uh, that's, that will be a compilation of already existing uh, parts and uh, solutions out there um, that we compose together uh, and which we want to map to each other. So, but to come there, we need to define requirements. And we will look for, e uh, we will try to define and collect um, for each use case a necessary and optional requirements. So the necessary requirements are required features and if they are missing the model fails to support the use case. And optional are um, uh, features that simplify the implementation of a use case or increase its um, usefulness. Okay. So I want to show you the work plan um, uh, and give you an overview of what uh, we really want to achieve in the next months. Um, so, okay, um, give me a second. Okay, so what we did uh, the last months uh, is um, we started to collect, collect user stories from the uh, working group members. And um, we have in the last few weeks uh, formalized use cases from those user stories and also grouped them in use case groups. And we have also collected uh, annotation practices and model and uh, models and terminologies uh, via that survey. And we also um, encourage people to uh, contribute with, uh, with the nitrogen, um, um, with, with nitrogen type of um, annotation practices and models. So to look at nitrogen and discuss the, uh, the, the answers from that perspective, because if you have um, nitrogen user stories and um, annotation practices, so uh, we can better compare and look at the data and, uh, and how we could annotate that. But uh, further on, we will look at other use cases. I don't know if I should say use cases. It's um, Gwen, how did we call that? Uh, nitrogen and uh, aerosol and temperature are the possible, yeah, observable yes. properties yes. we are looking at. Yes, to these, Barbara. Yeah. Yes. To these. yeah. Okay. So this is the collection phase. Now uh, we want to come from use cases to requirements. So we want to drive these requirements, um, and then develop our evaluation method uh, for. Um, understanding how well the models uh, um, comply with the requirements for the use cases. And uh, we then will also uh, try to, uh, to check the degree of support of the models uh, for, the diff for, the, for each user story. Um, and once we have done this, we can also validate um, uh, the results of this study with the concrete data we um, and, and data and, and try to do data annotation because we get from the annotation practices and from the survey also links to data and we can really try uh, test this and find out if the results uh, can be validated or not and uh, out of this we will then be able to develop uh, the interoperability framework 
And once we have this, we can then uh, go ahead and map um, the different approaches to this interoperability framework uh, and work on local design patterns. patterns. So this is the overall picture. Um, and going back to the other presentation, I will now um, uh, describe, sorry, what this means uh, in detail for the requirements analysis. So we first have, as I said before, to agree on use case definitions and involved actors. Uh, so this is what um, Arno presented before. Um, and we have to ask the user story contributors to check the allocation to use cases. So really to find out if the labels are correct or not and all this discussion on GitHub. Once we have done this, uh, we have also to define requirements for each use case as necessary and optional requirements. And I think this will be a work from, from the core group, but everybody is invited to contribute for, um, for sure on this. Um, and then we will also uh, check again if the user story contributors uh, um, would agree on these uh, requirements or if they need other requirements to be added here. Um, and then the third step would be to develop the evaluation method for the requirements analysis. I will come back to that again. Um, and uh, once we have this method, we can do the analysis and, and check uh, the, each pair of observer property model to, uh, and use case and see if, they, if it suits or not. And then also uh, analyze uh, the degree of support for each pair of observer property and user stories. So um, for the validation, um, we could um, ask user story contributors for data sets to support the requirements analysis, and then find uh, probably first select uh, nitrogen-based user stories with data sets for the analysis so that we can um, do a more focused study on it, and then validate analysis results with actual data sets and use cases. And how we uh, come to the method for requirement analysis, I think we, this is um, a work in progress. We have to find out, we have to do a literature study on um, methodologies used in ontology engineering, like um, competency questions, metrics applied and so on. So this is something that we have to look at um, in the next two months. Uh, to work out well this methodology, uh, decide, yeah, decide uh, which methodology to apply and how to adapt it for, yeah, how to uh, de develop it for our group. And here we are really happy if we get some contributions uh, from you. So uh, we have still yeah, 10 minutes left. <laughs> Uh, it's not a lot of time, but we could discuss on the requirements uh, in the next 10 minutes. And I would be very happy to get um, your input because this is um, at the moment, every, uh, this is really working progress and we started with the requirements right now. Okay, so I stop presenting. And I, I check uh, the chat if there's something that I have missed or you can really also just speak or uh, raise your hand. I, I can sum up a lot of the chat by saying a number of sort of micro engineering the uh, survey going forward as far as possibilities. And um, I think when you read that later, you'll be happy to think about some of those things. Um, I'm excited about, I, I think the survey is um, compelling because it's a pretty rich survey and I love the, the presentations when um, came up with for it. Uh, and if people are able to fill it out in thorough ways as they seem to be, it, it seems to be a pretty bountiful source of information. So that's been very nice. Thank you, John, for this. Yes. Any um, other comments? So for the requirements, sorry, uh, 
I'm thumbing Go ahead. but I'll, I'll that is, <laughs> I won't take long. For, for the requirements, is um, there any? <sighs> the problem I had filling out the survey and 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 why I didn't do it is because I. I could have listed a whole lot of requirements from a whole lot of different use cases, as I'm sure many of the people on the call could. Um, how are you imagining constraining the requirements or expanding the requirements to satisfy your original goals for this project? Good question. <laughs> yeah. Could, could, can we? Of, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Is there any way we can provide requirements to you or, or help in this process to focus things on what you need? Yes, I think uh, we need the use cases also as issues somewhere because we will work on GitHub again. We, we have the user stories, but we don't have the use cases as issues. And for the use cases, if, if you have them as require uh, uh, as issues we can try to gather the requirements for each of them and discuss about them i don't know yeah i, I think I'm for the please. barbara i think for and, and john um for the uh, use case and for the requirement we really need to focus on the key requirements that we need to address each use case so i mean Yes, I mean, it, we really have to be very systematic and very, um, I really think we can't think about every possibility. So we just really have to focus on, on say three, the three top requirements to address each use case. And there might be some requirements that obviously will, will be needed for more than, more than one, obviously. But, um, so we, I think uh, after this uh, session here, the next weeks, we will really concentrate on the methodology, how to collect all this information in a yeah, oral way, uh, so that we can get uh, this done really um, structured. Mm -hmm. I think we can learn a bit from, uh, Pierre here. we can learn a bit from the social science community, you know, how they go through survey documents and then code it, you know, they come up with a co coding scheme um, in order to organize that information and then act on it. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's approachable. It's, it's, not, it's not something that you have to be a social scientist for many years, but, uh, you know, it's, maybe we can get some help there. Okay, nice. perfect. Uh, Simon, you said that uh, you were also working on um, in at the core data group on Units, is it? Um, and you are collecting requirements for that. Are you still here? Um, yes, I'm still here. Um, we uh, we we we're, we're not doing um, as formal a process as you are running here. Um, we're seeing it as a more a much more well constrained and tightly constrained problem. Um, um, scales for numbers is 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 a much easier problem than the one that you're biting off. Um, uh, the the digital representation of units of measure drum um, task group within CoData um, indeed is 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 working on a, you know what what has to be seen as a closely related topic, but but I think a simpler one. Um, um, we're actually um, at the moment, looking at consolidating that work with um, some project work coming out of the um, uh, BIPM, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, um, the Paris-based um, organisation that takes care of SI. So, so, so I, I mean, I, I'm certainly because I'm involved a bit with that, somewhat reluctantly. Um, but 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 I I'm you know happy to provide a bridge between this work and that work. But 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 I would say that what you're doing here is is much more challenging because it, as I think Guru pointed out at the beginning, um, definitions of observable properties is is hard to separate from um, 
protocols and procedures. Um, I mean, some of us in, you know, myself, it's my, my earlier work in O&M, that actually was one of the goals of what we did there with that model. Um, but but um, uh, the units of measure thing is much, much, uh, much, much, much better defined. Okay. Um, we will then come back to you also uh, on, on uh, these different issues that you mentioned, um, also about the protocols and that stuff. Um, I, I have read here in, in the com comments that people want to have um, better information on the website of the iAdopt group. I must admit that it has been changed in the last two weeks or so, uh, and I was not able to update this information before this uh, session. But we will include all the inf all the links um, uh, to the Google Drive and so on on that website. Um, yeah, I also think that we need some help on finding a good evaluation method for the requirements. If somebody ha has um, experience on that, yeah, I would be very ha uh, happy <laughs> and get some ideas uh, where to look at. I must also say that Circo helped very much. Circo uh, Schindler, who is also here, um, he has worked on requirements for units um, of measurements. So this, I don't know, Simon, if you know his work, probably um, uh, Siko can post, um, put uh, the link to this uh, paper here, um, because this is uh, something uh, that I'm working on looking at too. Um, so would you like to say something, Siko, on this? Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here, but um, don't Are really you still know. working on it? No, this is pretty much for me at least um, uh, a finished project, but a colleague of mine um, started to generalize the approach we had in the past. So there's still somebody working on that. Sorry, which system was this circa? What do you mean by system? This was um, a, a units project? Um, no, actually in the first place we did pretty much the same exercise we are doing now with observable properties for the okay. units of measurements domain and then later on did an actual evaluation of ontologies for units of measurement regarding different criteria. Sorry, was uh, this can... tied in with the um, with the ontology, the OM ontology? Um, not exactly. So we were um, in quite some contact with them, but um, officially there was no connection. No. Can I po uh, put the link to the presentation there in in the chat uh, to the paper there? Of course. From you. Okay, I have it here so everybody can have a look at this too. Uh, it's not John that I want to address everybody. <laughs> okay. So we are already at the end uh, of this session. I think it was really interesting experience. Normally uh, we see each other discuss our um, and, and it's more a little bit more interactive than this, but um, I think it worked quite well. And we had uh, at the peak 35 um, people represented here. So I'm very happy. And I hope that you will join also the teleconferences where there we are normally 10 to five to 10 people. So we are happy if somebody else um, is uh, more frequently also uh, joining these teleconferences. Barbara, this was a really good meeting. Um, yeah. Well, well structured, well advertised, a great turnout. Um, I think we have also triggered some interesting conversation. You need to make sure that you make a copy of the chat 
um, to pick up some of the issues that were um, that were raised there. Um, yeah. So so um, we had a, I saw at least 36 people online at one point, which is um, quite comparable to um, what we might have expected in in a live meeting. So um, I think we did really well here. Yeah, thank you very much for your participation and please um, take care, um, stay healthy, <laughs> look at yourself and keep distance to the others. <laughs> uh, we have here really crazy times in Europe and don't know how long this will last. But fortunately, we can still stay in touch uh, also uh, virtually and continue to yeah. work on this. Yeah, I think we I think we might learn some some new work habits which might yeah. carry over anyway. So um, you know, tiny little silver linings. Yeah, and, and probably and, the environment and reducing the environment will will, yeah, will yes. gain. Impact. Yes. <laughs> I think I think oh. it worked really well as a meeting actually for something to be to be repeated. Yeah. Thank you very much for all the contributions, all the speakers and people uh, listening here. See you Thank the you. next time. Oh, thanks. It's good Thank hearing you. you. Bye. Good presentation. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you.